the speakers uh, for today. So Matthias is a professor of macroeconomics at Goethe University and a research fellow at the Halle Institute of Economic Research. Uh, Matthias discussant will be Anuka Ristiniemi, a colleague of mine at the ECB, uh, who is team lead economist in the Monetary Policy Strategy Division. And Anuka uh, has, prior to her start at the ECB, worked at Riksbank and Bank de France. Um, unfortunately, Moritz Schularik, who will give the second paper, is late today. So, but he, I was told that he will arrive in a minute. So he is president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and professor of economics at uh, Sciences Po and uh, research professor at New York University. Um, he also received the Leibniz and the Gossen Prize, two very prestigious German research prizes. And the discussant will be uh, José Luis uh, Pedro who is professor at Imperial College uh, London and uh, professor also in Barcelona and uh, has close links with the central banking community and has uh, different roles at the Bank of Spain, the ECB and the ESRB. So, so much for the introduction. Uh, let's start with the first paper by uh, Matthias, which is on uh, understanding post-COVID inflation dynamics with uh, Martin Harding and Jesper Linde, and the floor is yours, so 35 minutes. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's see. Uh, could I ask you to put up my slides, please? Thank you. Excellent. Um, now, could you go back one slide? Doesn't, this is not the right beginning. Uh, could you scroll back one slide, please? Thank you very much. All right, excellent. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks a lot to the organizers for having me. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, the work that I'm presenting is joint work with Jess Belinde from the IMF, who is uh, here with us today uh, too, as well as Martin Harding from the Bank of Canada. The usual disclaimer, of course, applies. Um, now, what are we grappling with in this paper? Well, this is a time series plot for core inflation measures in the United States, in the Euro area, as well as in, uh, in Canada. And if you look at that time series plot for the sample plotted, there are at least two major puzzles that have uh, you know, uh, caught, caught economists off guard. The first one indicated by the first vertical line is uh, the financial crisis and ensuing great recession, uh, where many economists have expected or had expected at the time deflation to happen and to occur as a fallout of the gigantic crisis that did took place. Now, when you look into the inflation figures presented in this graph, there was no deflation, and it remains a puzzle to many economists why we didn't see a deep fall in inflation in those periods. The, the, the buzzword is the missing deflation puzzle here. The second big puzzle that has caught macroeconomists and policymakers alike off guard is indicated by the second vertical line, which is the pandemic. And after the pandemic has uh, waned, uh, inflation across many industrialized countries has uh, basically taken off like a rocket. And many policymakers, academics alike, were puzzled how quickly inflation actually took off. What we aspire to do in this paper is to study those two episodes and to offer a unified framework, a way to think about these two events in a unified model. So we don't aspire to write a different model for the financial crisis and one for the post-COVID. No, we want to work with a unified model that has the ability to come to terms with accounting for the two key puzzles in terms of the missing deflation as well as the rocket-type takeover of inflation. All right. So... How do we do this and what's, so to say, the game that we are playing here? Um, somehow I have difficulties advancing my slides. If I just say next slide, please, is there a way that you could forward next slide, please? Thank you. Something is, uh, here we go. All right, so the challenge, just to be really clear, is to reconcile the missing deflation puzzle of the financial crisis with the recent surge in inflation. 
How do we do that? Well, we focus on the US in this paper. And we study inflation and output dynamics using the workhorse model that Frank Smats and, and Ralph Wouters have put together. Um, uh, now, we're going to put a, you know, a spotlight on one particular feature of that model. And that feature is a Kimball state-dependent uh, demand elasticity. It's a feature that's embedded in the Smets and Wouters model. It hasn't been utilized as much as we like it to be utilized. And so this is what this paper is essentially all about. After everything is said and done in our paper, what you're going to see is that the Phillips curve becomes state dependent. In the sense that the Phillips curve is not a linear relationship, but it's a boomerang or banana type shaped Phillips curves that we, you know, that the model then entails. And we're going to look into, you know, how do the shocks that hit the economy propagate in such an environment. All right. Now, for those who uh, may be still a little bit tired because of the early morning, let me just give you a preview of the results that I'm going to present in the next 30 minutes. Okay? We show that our variant of the original Smets and Varos model explains the modest um, uh, decline in inflation during the Great Recession, as well as the post-COVID you know, uh, uh, trajectory of inflation much better than the original, and I should add here, uh, Smets and Varos or linearized Smets and Varos model. What is particularly important is that the nonlinearity embedded in the Kimball aggregator is something that we put at full force when working with the model. So the nonlinear formulation of the model is really important to arrive at our key results. Okay? So put differently, had we worked with the nonlinear Smets-Varos model during the financial crisis and during the post-COVID you know, rocket trajectory, this model would have given us a much easier time coming to terms with the inflation dynamics that we had observed, that we have observed. Now, um, at the core uh, of our analysis is that the Phillips curve becomes steeper during booms and it becomes flatter during recessions. Okay. So that's going to be a, fe a feature that the model entails. Now, <clears throat> importantly, once you think about uh, how shocks propagate in such an environment, we document that cost push shocks or exogenous variations to firms' with marginal cost, and you pick your favorite paradigm. Uh, you can think about these are changes in energy prices that the model models in an exogenous reduced form way, or this is uh, China zero COVID type supply side chain disruptions. These cost sh sh push shocks that hit the economy, they are propagating in the economy in a different way depending on the state of the economy. In a boom or when inflation is high, a given cost push shocks adds an additional amount of inflation that's much larger than the same size cost push shock when it hits in a recession. So the, the effect of, in, of cost push shocks on the rate of inflation are inherently state depending in the framework that we are studying. Now, with this all in mind, this has, of course, important implications for policy making in the following way. The policy trade-off between stabilizing inflation and output in response to cost push shocks you know, becomes steeper you know, if inflation is elevated to begin with. So if inflation has left the bay, you know, if inflation is above target and substantially above target, it becomes increasingly more difficult for policy to stabilize inflation and output as compared to when inflation is cruising around the, the, the long-run target that the central bank may aspire to, to, to um, hit inflation. All right, now, let me put a little more flesh on each of these four bullets in walking you through the paper and the analysis. Okay. We are employing the workhorse macroeconomic model that is used across many central banks and policy-making institutions, including academia. In particular, we're using the smets wouters model, uh, whose ancestor is the Cristiano Eichenbaum and Evans model. Okay. Now, importantly, we work with the nonlinear formulation of that model. I'm not going to drag you through the details of the model. I take it there are many ECB economists here that have at least heard about the model, if not have worked with the model. Okay? What we're going to put some spotlight on is that we're working with the Kimball aggregator here that is embedded in this Metz and Wouters model. Now, if you happen to have forgotten about what that Kimball aggregator does, let me just give you, you know, where that Kimball aggregator is sitting in terms of the model. There are competitive firms, and I like to think about these firms as, say, you know, uh, restaurants putting together restaurant meals, and these competitive firms, uh, they aggregate uh, um, intermediate goods YF. Okay? So these intermediate goods YF are lettuce, tomato, bread, wine, beer, you name it, and they have a production technology to aggregate these goods into a restaurant meal. That technology is a Kimball technology. That's a Kimball aggregator. Okay? 
Now, we're going to study the implications of working with this Kimball aggregator. Um, now, since we want to work with an explicit nonlinear model, we need an explicit ex you know, functional form for that model. Um, <clears throat> and we're working here with the specification by Dotsie and King in the QGE, as well as Levin, um, uh, Lopez Salido, and Yun. And I'm not going to drag you through this rather complicated looking uh, uh, formula for the Kimball aggregator. But there is one key parameter that allows us to actually bridge the gap to something that you may are more used to working with. The parameter psi is of particular importance here. If you set psi equal to zero, you're back in the Dixit-Stiglitz type aggregator world that, well, that many of you may have heard and you are familiar with from, say, textbook uh, monetary economics uh, uh, texts. If psi is non-zero, you're going to enter the Kimball world. Now, what's so special about the Kimball world? Well, my slides have disappeared, unfortunately. It's kind of important to have the next slide on. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> now, so what's so important about this, you know, Kimball aggregator? Let me give you the intuition about the Kimball aggregator in one slide. And if you understand this slide, you have understood 95% of the paper, so it's downhill after this slide. All right? So, and with Kimball aggregation, what you're going to get is that the price setting problem of monopoly uh, price setters becomes, as becomes asymmetric. Okay? Uh, in particular, it has a you know, feature that once you work with Kimball, the you know, price setting problem becomes quasi kinked in terms of the implications of the demand curve embedded in the model. Right? Now, um, let me sort of say offer you a static example of Kimball aggregator, you know, optimal monetary policy price settings. So take this metz Vauders model and strip away, you know, price rigidity, wage rigidity, uh, uh, capital. So just take off all the important features from this metz Vauders model. What you arrive at is a static monopoly power price setting problem. That's at the core of the model. A period by period price setting problem for a monopolist. Okay? When you work with the Kimball aggregator, you're going to see that uh, the, the Kimball aggregator gives rise to strategic complementarities in the following sense, that the demand elasticity for these intermediate goods, tomatoes, lettuce, beef, beer, wine, they are an increasing function of a firm's price. So if a firm increases its price, the demand elasticity increases. So that is, more and more customers are going to leave the store. That's basically the idea. Okay? So a firm increasing its price, it's going to lose proportionally more customers as it keeps on increasing compared to the Dixit Stiglitz case. Okay? Now, even with this in mind, it turns out that firms increase prices sharply when marginal costs increase. How is that possible? Well, if marginal costs increase, so think about an energy price shock, think about zero COVID in China, you know, your favorite examples, that squeezes problem, profits of firms. And firms have an incentive to raise their prices. Now, they rise prices by more than under Dixit Stiglitz for the following reason. Take a look at the left uh, subplot here. That's a, a stylized way of plotting the demand curve for intermediate goods. It has the feature that the demand elasticity is state dependent and increases with the relative price of a firm. Okay? If you increase the price, you're going to lose a lot of demand. What this implies is that this has implications for marginal revenue of a firm. So a monopolist you know, seeks to maximize profits, and it does so by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Now, the middle plot plots the marginal revenue curve implied by the optimal profit maximizing problem of the firm subject to the kink demand curve that we see on the left hand side. The blue line is the marginal revenue curve, and the key implication or the key feature of that curve is it's concave. Okay? It's concave in the firm's price. As a firm increases the price, it's losing more and more customers, so revenue at the margin is going to you know, uh, get smaller and smaller at the margin for increasing the price. All right? Now, with Dixit Stiglitz, the blue line would be simply a linear in log you know, specification. If you, for a second now, think about what is the profit maximizing f uh, price of this firm, well, it equates marginal revenue, the blue curve, with you know, marginal cost. And for a moment, just consider the a level of marginal cost depicted by the black dashed dotted line, which is horizontal here. The intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost, that gives you the optimal price that the monopolist would choose. Now, consider variations in marginal cost. Consider a 10% rise in marginal cost depicted by the red broken line. What you're going to see is that the, the price goes up, so the firm charges a higher price, and it you know, charges a substantially higher price. 
Let's consider the exact opposite, same size change in marginal cost, namely a cut in marginal cost, depicted by the pinkish uh, dotted line. You see there, firms are going to cut their price, but now if you compare on the horizontal axis, on the price axis, you compare the absolute changes of prices, you see that firms increase their prices more than they decrease their prices. That's the key feature that the Kimball aggregator brings home for us. Okay? And we're going to utilize that from now on in the Smets and Bowders full, fully uh, fledged model. Okay? So in other words, if you, not, you know, do this on a continuous change of marginal cost, the far right plot depicts that the optimal price is a convex function of firms' marginal cost. So if marginal costs go up, firms are going to increase their prices more than if marginal costs go down. This is exactly what we're going to uh, lever on in terms of our analysis, in terms of addressing the missing deflation and the, missing, and, and the, the COVID you know, rocket shape uh, takeoff of inflation. All right, if you made it through here, you made it through 95% of the paper. Okay. From now on, it's just applying that in a fully fledged Smets and Bowers environment. Okay. So let's put back price rigidity, let's put back nominal rigidities in wage setting, let's put back capital, let's put back you know, habit persistent, et cetera. So the standard kind of elements that we work with in, in industrial size New Keynesian models. Okay. Um, when you then linearize the model, you're going to get an object that many of you have seen in grad school, uh, which is the New Keynes and Phillips curve, which on the left-hand side has the quasi-difference of inflation as a function of the right-hand side quasi-difference in inflation expectations, marginal cost, as well as an exogenous disturbance, uh, what we typically call a cost push shock. Now, where does Mr. Kimball come in here? Well, Miles Kimball comes in here via the slope coefficient kappa. Huh? So <clears throat> kappa is the slope of marginal cost, and the Kimball parameter or the Kimball aggregation parameter comes in here in the, in the basement or in the denominator of that kappa. So with Kimball aggregation, you typically get a smaller kappa. That's what we learned from uh, uh, Raf uh, Wouters and Frank Smets in their 2007 AER paper, that with Kim aggregation, firms change their prices by less, and it helps the model come to terms with data. That's beautiful. Okay. Now, what we do is we're not working with this linear formula. Rather, we're working with the nonlinear formulation of the uh, uh, model. Okay? So now, how, how does the Phillips curve look like in a nonlinear environment? Well, it's a set of not so pretty looking equations, in fact. It's not much to write home about, except for that you can represent the optimal pricing problem in a set of nonlinear recursive equations. So these equations are recursive, so you can type them in in your favorite nonlinear solver package quite easily. Okay? If anything, marginal costs are showing up now in the third equation in a multiplicative way with the markup shock. Okay? So the shock that we're going to highlight in our analysis going forward shows up in a multiplicative way. Of course, it works through all the other three nonlinear equations you know, in general equilibrium. By contrast, if you look at the linearized Phillips curve, you see that the markup shock is additively separable. That's going to play a role going forward in our analysis. All right, so how are we going to work then with this model? I'm going to spare you the details on all the other elements of the model. They're completely standard. And we're going to work with this model by first parameterizing it and then solving and filtering data with it. Now we're going to follow our earlier work in 2022 in terms of parameterizing the model. We're estimating the model on, and that's important, pre-financial crisis data. So we don't allow the model to neither see the Great Recession data, nor see, in terms of parameters, the rocket takeoff inflation data post-COVID. The model doesn't see any of that data. So the parameters are informed by using you know, 15 year old data, outdated data. So we really put the model to a hard test. Is the model able to come to terms with something that the model really hasn't seen before? Okay. There's a little bit of, so to say, some wrangling on the parameters. Long story short, we are estimating the Kimball parameter in the model. Okay. So there's a way to estimate that, and the paper provides you with all the details. We then <coughs> use that model, and we are solving that model, and we fill the data with that model. How are we solving that model? Well, we solve it with the so-called extended path 
method that's embedded, for instance, in Dynair. Goes back to Fair and Taylor, 1983, um, Econometrica. Some people, you know, may have heard about the time stacking algorithm or the two-point boundary value algorithm. These are all the same things that we utilize, uh, and it comes very handy in terms of Dynair. Now we have all our rep, uh, codes available online, on say on my website, for instance. Uh, so if you want to work with this nonlinear model, it's really grab and go and hit a button. We then could do stochastic simulations with the model, and the only thing that you know, we impose here is in certainty equivalence as a sort of say element that this, the solver imposes here on us. Okay. Now, importantly, we are going to show you now you know, the differences between the linearized model and the nonlinear model implications. Okay. So I'm going to take you on a tour now. What are the implications of working with the nonlinear versus the linear model? Let's get going first on how do Phillips curves look like in this environment. And uh, what you're going to see is that, you know, with quasi-kink demand, the Phillips curve, the Phillips curve become convex in terms of the output inflation space. So let's consider for a moment you're hitting the model only with demand shocks, the left-hand plot. And on the x-axis you have the output gap and on the y-axis you have inflation. And you only hit the model with demand shocks. So shocks that move output and inflation gap in the same direction. What you see is in the linearized model, you're going to get a linear relationship. That shouldn't be a big surprise between the output gap and inflation. Okay. It's depicted by the blue dots in this scatter plot. Now, if you take the nonlinear formulation, you're going to get what we call a banana type Phillips curve or a boomerang shaped Phillips curve. You're going to see there's some curvature in there. Now that curvature is going to have very important implications for addressing the challenge that I put up here on my first slide. Particularly, as you go in recessions, so as inflation, when in the output gap goes toward minus 5, minus 10, as you go into the recessionary area, you're going to see that the red line starts to curve and bend, and inflation does fall, but it falls at a much smaller, a slower rate than in the linearized model. Now, if you put that to minus 15, you're really going to see that the linearized model predicts deflation, while the nonlinear model doesn't predict deflation. Okay. Something that we have put the spotlight on in our earlier paper. Now, if you look at the other end of the curve, you'll see that as inflation goes up, so as inflation is in the area of, say, 5, 6, 7%, you're going to see differences between the nonlinear and the linear model. Okay. In particular, you're going to see that as the economy enters a boom phase, or if inflation is high, you know, the economy gonna, is going to see higher inflation rates going forward. Now, on the right-hand side, we redo the exact experiment for supply shocks. So these are shocks that move output and inflation in opposite directions, uh, like, for instance, a cost-push shock. And you see that there is a similar feature embedded that, you know, it's a little harder to see than for demand shocks, but there's the same feature at work, namely that you're going to get nonlinearities in the Phillips curve. All right. So what do we do with this element now in terms of this, uh, in, 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 in this model? Well, we're going to subject the... Uh, model now to cost push shocks. So we're going to subject it to increases in energy prices, to zero COVID, China and our harbors are locked, uh, locked down strategies. So anything that sort of say makes firms marginal costs go up in an exogenous way. And how do we do this in practice? Well, you know, when we're going to select given points on the x axis, so when the output gap is at 5% or 10% or minus 5 and 10%, we're going to subject the model to a one time, once in a deviation markup shock, a positive or an adverse markup shock. And that's what you see in this graph. Okay? So the solid blue line is how does the Phillips curve shift in the linearized model if there's a one standard deviation markup shock? And you see it changes roughly half a percent. So the blue line, the Phillips curve, just shifts up linearly and by the same amount across the entire you know, scatter region here. Okay? Um, so that's something that you know, the standard Smets and Wauders model in its linearized formulation would give us. We then redo exactly the same experiment for the nonlinear model, which has important implications. First, you see that you know, the nonlinear Phillips curve shifts up too. But it shifts and tilts at the same time. If inflation is high to begin with, so if you are in the 10% output gap region and inflation is already ratcheted up to 8%, the same size markup shock pushes up inflation by a large amount compared to both the linearized model, but more importantly, compared to a situation when you are 
in an environment where inflation is subdued. So if you do the same experiment, say when the output gap is at minus 10 and inflation is below the central bank's target, the same markup shock produces only very little amplification. So in this sense, markup shocks are state, the effects of markup shocks are state dependent, dependent in our environment. Okay. <clears throat> So long story short, there is no such answer to what is the effect of a one standard deviation markup shock? Well, the answer is it depends on the state of the economy. We redo this for supply shocks, and we're going to get the same answer there, that you know, if the economy is not driven by, mark by demand shocks, but if it's driven by supply shocks, we have the same implication there. Okay? So when the underlying economy is driven by markup shocks and you get additional markup shocks, you're going to get the same amplification of cost push shocks. All right, now what do we do with all this? Well, this is kind of keeping it still at the expository level in terms of demand and supply shocks. If, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the Smets and Wouters model, you know this model has seven different types of shocks. There's TFP shocks, there's financial shocks, there's government spending shocks, there's um, investment specific shocks, there's a whole battery of shocks. Okay. What we do in this paper is we then go through each shock at a time and redo the analysis that we've seen here. So what we do is we just select, say, the monetary policy shock, and we simulate a long time series from the model for inflation and the output gap using a monetary policy shock. And then in each point in time, we're gonna add a little bit of a markup shock, and we see how much amplification do we get there. Okay? And then we redo this for the financial shocks and for the government spending shocks, each at a time. What we find is that in all cases, for all the shocks in the model, we see that cost push shocks are amplified when inflation is high to begin with. So if inflation has you know, reached four to five percent and we see an invasion of Russia into Ukraine and energy prices exploding, the nonlinear model predicts a much larger kick on inflation than the linearized model does. Okay? Um, so the left-hand subplot here shows that for monetary policy shocks, you see that the the blue, the blue scatters is this is the effect of an additional markup shock on the rate of inflation depicted on the x axis, on the y axis. On the x axis, we have the initial level of inflation. So, this is something like a cheat sheet, say, for policymakers or interested academics. If inflation initially is, say, 3%, then the linearized rise model predicts an additional markup shock is going to you know, lift inflation by about half a percent. And the nonlinear model gives you a similar answer, about you know, half a percent. If you go to the right of the x-axis, and if inf initial inflation, say, is 5%, right? so the economy has moved and has evolved, and you're going to start seeing inflation numbers at the level of 5%, you're going to see now pr pronounced differences between the nonlinear and the linear model. In particular, you're going to see that the nonlinear model suggests that the same markup shock has twice as a large effect on inflation than the linearized model. Rather than half a percent, you're going to get one percent, okay? just in that little illustration. Now, if you're interested, we redo this for the other six shocks, so for financial shocks and demand shocks and, and government spending shocks. You're going to get the same you know, qualitative, sometimes even quantitative results. Each of these shocks has this amplification feature in. All right. Now, once you enter this nonlinear world on thinking about what drives inflation, especially at policy institutions, there's always this buzzword coming up, you know, how much risk is there to the inflation outlook? How much inflation risk is embedded in the economy you know, at the current juncture? When you solve this model nonlinearly, you're able to actually pin down how much risk is there in terms of inflation moving around. And what we show is that you know, inflation risk depends on whether, the, when the, whether inflation is surging or whether inflation is descending. In particular, we show that inflation risk increases substantially when you are on an upslope in terms of the rate of inflation already. So if inflation has started to creep up, this model, our model predicts that there is more, it's more likely that we're going to see higher inflation going forward rather than when inflation is descending. The left plot makes that, little, makes that point. The red line is uh, showing you what is the distribution of inflation if you are hit with adverse, uh, um, uh, with adverse um, cost push shocks, 
what, what happens with the distribution of inflation when those cost push shocks hit you on an upward trajectory of inflation. So, for instance, you know, we've seen China, we have the supply side chain disruptions, we've seen all that, inflation was ratcheting up already, and then comes the energy price shock on top of all that. In such an environment, you will see, on average, more probability mass shifted to higher inflation rates. Conversely, if you're on a downside slope already of inflation, you're going to see less. And the nonlinear model allows you to distinguish and work with that in a very, uh, um, in a very um, a rigorous way uh, compared to the linearized model. All right. Now, with all this in mind, I want to turn my you know, last six minutes here on um, thinking about the implications for policymaking, in particular monetary policymaking. And once you work with this model environment, what are the trade-offs for monetary policymakers? And I want to make that using two different um, uh, pieces of analysis. The first bullet, I'm going to walk you through what happens if you look at impulse response functions. Okay? So we're going to put the model into a position where the model replicates exactly the data in the first quarter of 2022. And then we subject the model, so the model really, you know, really explains all the data in that very quarter exactly up to the fifth, sixth decimal. And then we subject the model to a cost push shock, so think about Ukraine, or to a monetary policy shock. And we're going to look at how different these um, you know, responses are to normal times. In the second part, we are then going to look at the policy trade-off frontiers, namely how more complicated policymaking becomes for central bankers once inflation has left the bay and what needs to be done according to our analysis and how painful that can be in terms of the associated output losses. Now let's go for the impulse response functions. So what we do here is we are filtering the data with our nonlinear model up to the sec first quarter of 2022. So the model exactly replicates that data. And then we are giving, we're kind of imposing a one standard deviation price cost push shock to that model. So think about the energy price explosion uh, that took place, of course, here at a, at a lower scale. What you see is that the solid blue line on the top left graph shows you the response of inflation. And so that our model predicts that inflation goes up by twice as much than the linear pendant type model does. So when you linearize the model, the answer would be that inflation goes up to one, by 1%, the nonlinear model predicts two, even two and a quarters of a percent. Okay. Note that that hike in, in inflation does happen even though policy is much more aggressive in terms of how it reacts to policy in the nonlinear model than in the linearized model. All right, so that's the, the, the effect of a price cost push in the first quarter of 2022. Let me turn to what happens if the central bank changes its course of action and deviates from the Taylor rule by hiking rates up and above its regular you know, rule-based monetary policy rule. So in this plot, again, we're filtering the data up to the first quarter of 2022, and then we impose a one-time contractory monetary policy shock that top right uh, subplot here increases the policy rate by 75 basis points on an annual basis. What you see is that monetary policy is more efficacious in containing inflation in the nonlinear model. Inflation does fall by a quarter of a percent on an annual basis uh, in the nonlinear model compared to the linearized model. So good news is policy is more effective when inflation is high to begin with Bad news is, once you see cost push shocks happening, that really ratchets up the you know, rate of inflation in nonlinear non terms, in the nonlinear model. So it's a race between those two, and it turns out that the uh, cost push shock is stronger in terms of an inflation effect than the monetary policy effect is, especially when inflation is high to begin with. So if you're working in an environment where inflation is 4 to 5 percent, another you know, cost push shock is really going to take inflation off like a rocket, and it's very hard for policy to contain that. Let me make that last point a little more concisely um, in the following way. And I apologize for the little turbulent plot. I want to study what happens if a central bank sees the cost push shock happening and wants to undo the effects of inflation. So think about an inflation nutter central bank. So I see energy prices surging and I aspire as a governor to stabilize inflation at the level of inflation before the shock did happen. Okay. How much do I have to move my policy rate to achieve that? Okay. I, wanna, I want you to focus on the first column of this plot. 
The top left is the policy rate response over the first year in response to a markup shock or a cost push shock. Plotted as a function of the initial level of inflation. So if inflation initially is 2%, so if you are at 2% initially, a given cost push shock requires the central bank to raise its rate by about 2 percentage points per annum okay, at an annual basis. So you know, but with 2% initial inflation, you have a moderate increase in inflation according to the model that actually coincides with the linear version of the model. Now, if you redo this analysis and inflation has crept up to, say, 6% or 8%, and you have an energy price crisis, for instance, in Europe, you're going to see that the required tightening is much, much stronger in the nonlinear model you would need to tighten policy much more aggressively and hawkish according to our model, namely by increasing the policy rate to about six to eight percentage points compared to the no um, uh, cost push shock scenario. Now this is of course an extreme type policy. This is in the policy that keeps the rate of inflation constant, so that's the first column, sen uh, second plot. That's a policy that aspires to exactly undo the, the energy price shock in terms of inflation. But it's a good benchmark to start thinking about maybe one of the polar cases. I'm going to consider the second polar case uh, next. Now, embedded, of course, in that is that you're going to see a, a big fall in economic activity associated with stabilizing inflation that has grave consequences, of course, for the output gap and economic activity on the, on the labor market. You can go to the other polar case, and that's what the second column shows you, namely what happens if uh, you aspire to fully stabilize the output gap in term, in when the markup shock hits. And so here the output gap is completely stabilized and you see that then changes in monetary policy rates aren't sort of say, you know, big and you know, most of the hit happens here on the rate of inflation. Importantly, again, the nonlinear model predicts uh, a bigger increase in, in inflation than the, non, than the linearized model does. Okay. Um, my time is up, so I'm gonna skip the remaining couple of slides. So what do these slides do? Well, these slides provide you with an assessment. How, do, how does the model fit the post-COVID data? And we do this in two steps. We are computing forecasts. And uh, these forecasts you know, show two things. That the nonlinear model, as inflation keeps on going up, becomes increasingly better at forecasting inflation. And more importantly, the nonlinear model very early on, as early as in the middle 2021, 21s, you know, offers a view that there's a risk that inflation may get, get out of hand you know, very quickly. Okay? So the, the forecast width, the forecast bands are, very, are much wider in the nonlinear model compared to the linearized model, according to the um, uh, nonlinear model. So the nonlinear model signals much, much earlier than this, the linearized model that you know, there is a danger that inflation may get out of hand. Second, we show you know, what are the uh, shocks that you would need in both models to fit the data exactly. And you shouldn't be surprised if I tell you that the nonlinear model requires smaller shocks to fit the data. Okay? And, and, and we're just going to display that in terms of our analysis. All right, so let me wrap up and let me offer a few sort of say key takeaways. Um, what I tried to do in the last half hour was to show you some of our research that we did in late 2021, early 2022, uh, in working with a model that allows us to both think about the Great Recession and the you know, vigorous increase in inflation rates uh, post-COVID in a unified framework. There's one model that uh, does a good job in accounting for both of these very extreme you know, cases of inflation dynamics in two very prominent uh, economic uh, episodes. Turns out the nonlinear Phillips curves um, provide us a good way of thinking about this as a, a state dependence in the propagation of shocks. And that turns out to be very helpful in thinking about, especially the post-COVID period. And finally, the model offers uh, rich implications from, for policymaking. And um, I'd like to close with that. And thank you very much again to the organizers for having me. It's been a big honor and pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. So I would like now like to ask Anuka to the lectern to give the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, um, so I was very happy to get a chance to discuss this paper, which I already knew quite well, as we have also been uh, very thankful for you to share the codes and be working on this paper somewhat already. Uh, let me see if this works. No. Could you uh, put the next slide? Okay, so Matthias did a very good job presenting the paper already, so I will go quickly through some of the key features of, of, uh, of the model. So, so essentially uh, what this paper does is it shows that uh, when you have a high inflation environment, all the shocks um, essentially get amplified, the transmission gets amplified. So when you have a nonlinear Philips curve as is standard in the Smets and Bauters and you solve the model really nonlinearly, then you have a quasi-kink demand, and which means that the impact of shocks is amplified uh, in a high inflation environment. So the setting is a version of the Smets and Bauters model that they solve non-linearly or keep with the non-linear formulation. And uh, the parameters of the linear version are estimated mostly on the US data between 1965 and 2007. As Matthias said, they exclude the uh, great financial crisis periods as well as the pandemic and so on. And some parameters related to pricing and Kimball aggregator, they are updated uh, by calibrating or estimating separately to be consistent with micro evidence and macro estimations. So what is this quasi-kinked uh, demand? So I copied this uh, same graphs that Matthias also had in his presentation. So it means that... Um, Essentially, the firms try to stabilize their markups or their uh, profits. So when, when marginal costs are very low, then uh, the firms have very little incentive to cut prices because they can't create much demand. You can see that the demand elasticity in the top right panel is uh, upward sloping and convex. So it means that if, you, if, the, if the firms were to cut prices in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where where uh, marginal costs are low, consumers would not be willing to increase their consumption much because their demand is already high and satiated. The other opposite uh, situation is when inflation is high and the marginal costs are high, we have uh, energy shocks, then in this case markups are low and the firms have to sort of uh, stabilize their uh, get their marginal revenues up and even though they face a substantial drop in demand they uh, would increase prices more than they would otherwise do. So what are the implications of having such a non-linear model? So um, in this graph uh, we see that when inflation is high both demand and supply shocks get amplified suggesting that uh, when you have a deeper downturn and higher inflation you will uh, have that for, uh, for a given supply shock. So essentially the Phillips curve becomes steeper and steeper um, uh, in this situation. At the same time, as Matthias also alluded, uh, monetary policy transmission to inflation is amplified. So um, the impact of uh, policy shock on inflation is actually larger. So you can stabilize inflation better and actually with a lower output, output cost as well, because this really feeds into the inflation rather than uh, the output. So the trade-off is uh, lower. But then once you take into account that these cost per shocks propagate more strongly than the monetary policy shocks, so when you put the two things together, uh, you actually have an increase in the trade-off. So uh, I find the paper very, very interesting. They have done a lot of exercises and really teased out uh, the understanding of how all the shocks uh, transmit in this model. So I really uh, could not find much to comment in there. Uh, I went for the monetary policy um, exercise in here. I hope you can see these charts, which Matthias also uh, sh showed just now. Uh, that show that uh, in the in the to in the left side column you see oi, in the left side column you see the responses of inflation or the forecast of inflation you can compare 
the linear model in black and the nonlinear model in blue. And you can see that as you go further in time, as you come closer and closer to the to the true crisis times and high inflation, the nonlinear model um, then predicts uh, the high inflation developments better. So I just picked up on one sentence that was in the in the in the paper, which says that the forecasts are based on a quick normalization of policy rate, which you see in the middle column. So you can see that the interest rate goes up to sort of 6% or so on uh, in the forecast. I'm not sure why this is jumping. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, the interest rate goes on to 6% or so on. And the authors say in the paper that uh, if the rate path had been constant as in the data, then the inflation forecast would be even higher. So then uh, they draw the conclusion that our model suggests that loose monetary policy in the US is likely to have had an important role in driving the post-COVID inflation dynamics. So I wanted to uh, analyze this a little bit if this could be indeed the case. So what I did was uh, take the model uh, as I had the codes and put it into the toolbox uh, that also solves for optimal policy. And then I filtered the linear model. This is not uh, uh, able to handle nonlinear models, at least at the moment. Uh, so I put the model in there. And I filtered it, and you can see the um, you can see the uh, red line in here in the left hand side. That's the annualized interest rate, and uh, annualized int. I don't know where this is. Jump. I'm not sure what is going on, but this keeps uh, jumping. So maybe somebody is pressing the buttons a bit. Uh, okay, so you see the annualized interest rate and it gets sort of similar result in this uh, sort of forecast uh, where the interest rate rises to around 5% or, or even above. And uh, that suggests that uh, policy indeed should have been uh, higher according to this Taylor rule specification compared to the actual interest rate which you see in green in here. Uh, what was striking then, I thought that uh, perhaps the steady state interest rate is quite high, and in, indeed it is. So this is plotted in the solid uh, red line in the left-hand side graph, and the steady state interest rate is 6.5% approximately in the model. That's because it's estimated up to two data up to 2007. Um, so... Um, this 6.5% level of the steady state interest rate could be compared to some measures that are out there, maybe the more conservative estimate by Lubick and Mathis at 4.3% is the highest one that we have now. Uh, the survey of primary, primary dealers puts the long run at 2.6, uh, sort of consistent with Holston, Laubach and Williams at 2.5, and then Laubach and Williams at 3.2. So the 6.6, uh, 6.5 even uh, compared to the conservative estimate of Lubick and Mathis seemed quite high. So what I did in this model is I set up an ad hoc neutral rate in the model as a time varying intercept in the Taylor rule. I also tried a few other things like uh, change in the uh, beta or the, or the sigma, the risk aversion uh, parameter, but I thought this would be sort of a most uh, cleanest ad hoc way of doing it. So I set up, you can see the equation here, uh, where I set the R star as an intercept in the Taylor rule. And then I set up a process for it, where it is uh, AR1 process and just has a shock with the AR1 parameter very high at 0 0.99. And then what I did was observe the neutral rate and I used the Lubick and Mathis uh, measure. Now in this graph, you see the red lines from the chart before, as well as the black line, which is now the new Taylor rule based uh, interest rate path that tends to a much lower level. So it doesn't peak anymore above 5% and it uh, gets uh, to a lower, lower level at the end of 2025. So uh, potentially that uh, result that we have in the forecast of, um, of that interest rate path being very high is uh, to a part uh, um, driven by the very high steady state interest rate in the model. You can see the neutral rate path below, which uh, goes to around 4.3%. And, and the path, the black one, is now more consistent, maybe with the actual rate, 
although it rises quicker uh, than, than the actual rate which you see in green. Then I also checked what if, uh, what if the central bank was following optimal policy. So I set up a simple um, loss function with equal weights on inflation and smoothing at one and the output gap weight on zero for now. And uh, because this model solves with expected shocks, I set up the credibility of forward guidance uh, to 0 0.3 uh, so that uh, forward guidance is dampened in a reasonable way and we don't have a forward guidance puzzle. And you can find now, you can see the blue line, which is the optimal policy, um, policy response. And that is also quite close actually uh, to the baseline response and it goes even to a lower level uh, later on so that we don't have this undershooting in inflation at the end of the end of the period and this also is not too far off from the from the uh, actual rate of course we have to keep in mind here that this is only done with the linearized model and if we had a non-linear model where inflation really gets much higher because of the amplification it would require even higher interest rate, which would mean that probably these lines would be too low for that. Another thing that I noticed in the model is that the inflation target is uh, set fairly, fairly high at 3.5 percent. It's also estimated because, of course, Fed only started doing inflation targeting at 2 percent fairly late. So in the model, the target is 3.5. So then I wanted to study what is the consequence of lowering it to 2 percent. And there are two things that are happening that are sort of uh, countering each other. One is that, of course, the steady state nominal interest rate declines. So that, that uh, means that you don't have to raise the rates as much as you would have if the neutral rate is very high or the steady state interest rate is very high. But at the same time, uh, policy has to bring inflation to a lower level, so it needs to be tighter. And these two effects sort of... Um, um, balance it, each other out and in this case uh, you would have to have a um, policy rate path which is actually quite similar to, to the one uh, before we uh, lowered the interest rate, uh, sorry, the inflation target. In this case, if you would do uh, then optimal policy, this would call for much higher interest rate as you see in uh, blue here because uh, the target is now lower, so you have to bring inflation lower towards the end of the period, and that's why you want to really have quite a, quite a bit higher interest rate uh, in, the, in, the, in the optimal case. Uh, one could also consider then, because all of these exercises were done with, uh, with uh, zero output gap weight, so if we would set the output gap weight to 0 0.25, which would be consistent with equal weight across inflation, unemployment and smoothing. By Okun's law we get uh, sort of, if we have one on unemployment we get by Okun's law 0 0.25 on output gap and in this case now we have both the neutral rate in a model and we have a lower inflation target for all of that to be consistent. We get that uh, the blue, uh, blue line, the optimal uh, policy is very close to the close to the actual uh, interest rate path in green. But of course, again, this is only a linear model and potentially if we had the nonlinear features here, you would need to have a higher interest rate. Um, then, um, in this case exercise, I used a very conservative measure of Lubick and Mathis uh, for the nominal neutral rate, which goes up to 4.3%. If I would use a measure which is somewhere in between the range of measures uh, that I highlighted yesterday, uh, earlier, <laughs> not yesterday, uh, then we would get a lower, um, uh, that would be the Laubach and Williams uh, measure, which I think goes to 3.6 or so. And I set the output gap weight to zero again. And because the neutral rate is much uh, lower, you don't have to increase the interest rate so high. So in this case, uh, policy would be close to optimal again. Uh, if you look at the black line, that's the Taylor rule based uh, interest rate, and that's much lower than the, than the actual rate uh, that has uh, already developed and is expected, to, uh, expected going forward. And that would suggest that potentially even in a nonlinear model, um, in, even in a nonlinear model, the rate, uh, 
path that the Fed has followed has been could have been enough already. And uh, optimal policy then calls for something um, peak level of sim similar peak level as in the actual interest rate path, but again slightly more uh, earlier. That's it. Uh, so in in my opinion, the paper is excellent. I really enjoy reading it again. Uh, it's very uh, very uh, inspiring how the authors explore the kink demand and how they use the nonlinear tools to tease out many exercises. Even though we know working with nonlinear uh, models is not easy because we cannot use the uh, standard tools. Um, and using the inversion filter where you can invert the shocks and, uh, and, the, and the variables, the authors are able to then uh, filter actually the model in the fully nonlinear model and draw conclusions for the current period. And I understand that it is some merit estimating only until 2007, but in order to study the current period, especially policy implications, it would be important to, to look at some of the crucial parameters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anuka. And before I open up the floor for questions, and I would also like to remind the online participants to file in their questions, I would like to give Matthias the opportunity to briefly respond to Anuka's uh, discussion. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Anuka, uh, for a great presentation, a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great food for thought for follow-up work that we actually are pursuing as we speak. Um, I like your simulations very much, and I, I understand the desire to maybe, you know, <clears throat> rejigger some of the key parameters of the model beyond, so to say, um, and, and thinking about what's going on right now. Let me maybe give uh, you a little bit of our perspective, why we did what we did. We did not want to fiddle with parameters of this Metz and Valdez model all that much. And you know, th that was driven by sort of say the idea, okay, let's do one change at a time, which is you know, isolate the effects of working with the nonlinear model equations rather than the linear equations. And we were not sort of say driven by a desire to you know, change the steady state, normal interest rate, et cetera, et cetera. I agree with you that um, for you know, further work, for follow-up work, one sort of say ought to look perhaps into these dimensions. And I think what you have done is a, is a very interesting um, you know, a starting point for doing that. I understand it's a linear model based, so to say, implications. And you know, extending that to the nonlinear model, that would be cer that's certainly super interesting. We had the position of, okay, let's not fiddle with the parameters. And in fact, let's give this model a hard time as possible to try to explain or come to terms with the data that we see. That was really, we didn't want to make this easy for the model. So that's why we froze the estimation or the parameters with, 2007 data, uh, with data from 2007. Now that's a long time ago, but we really want to ask, okay, this model should have never seen the financial crisis, great recession, nor the rocket-shaped inflation takeoff. What, you know, can this model get us any clue about these two events once we ask the model to tell us something about it? And so that was how we kind of, you know, motivated our kind of uh, disciplining our parameter choices. Um, now, um, again, Anuga, I, I really appreciate your uh, suggestions. And as we speak, we have follow up work going on. And I, I would really appreciate uh, taking a closer look at your work. Uh, that you have done and, and seeing how we could perhaps sort of say address that in, in our subsequent work going forward. And um, so thank you so much, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Klaus. Thank you. Yeah, Klaus Maaser from the ECP. Wonderful discussion, wonderful paper. One, one uh, two questions. Um, what explains in your model uh, the increase in, in inflation before 22. Now, I mean, inflation in the US, in the Euro area, was already quite high at that point. If central banks understand what you're showing, this non-linearity, and then if you already have high inflation, the cost per shock is even more difficult, worse, then should central banks not react uh, already to, to an inflation which goes above 2% stronger and earlier before? That is the first question. And why is, what is the setup of your model that you don't, I mean, at least in your presentation, I didn't hear that you discussed this episode, no? the 21, second half of 21, strong increase in inflation. No? What was the causes in your model and why did monetary policy not strongly react 
if they would know your, your model and results. Thank you. All right, so just to collect, so mm -hmm. it's fine with you. So over there was another one. Uh, many thanks for the, the great talk and the great discussion. I was just wondering, the Phillips curve can be convex, either because the relationship between inflation and marginal costs is convex, and that's what the Kimball demand curves give you, or because the relationship between marginal cost and demand is convex, and stories like bottlenecks, etc., would be more about this one. So question one, does it matter where the convexity comes from? And second, did you go for this one because you find it more plausible or for tractability purposes? Okay, and Giuseppe Ferreira from Bank of Italy. So we saw in Sintra uh, Francesco Lippi presenting a different state dependency in the Phillips curve. It was about the frequency with which firms adjust prices. Here the state dependency is in the response to marginal costs. So I was wondering, since in, in that paper you have that when price increase, increase more than what we have in linear model, but also when they decrease, they decrease faster. What is the implication here, if, if you can compare with those results? Thank you. And just behind you, Leo. Uh, Leo van Tadden from the ECB. Uh, let me first say uh, I enjoyed really very much the presentation and all the discussion. So well done, very, very clear. Uh, the question I have is a very simple one. I mean, to me, the, and reflecting maybe a little bit my own ignorance, I mean, what you describe, Matthias, to me, really looks like a very good comparison of what you can do in a linear or linearized environment and in a nonlinear environment, uh, going beyond this particular application. And I guess from an empirical perspective, you know, it can always be advantageous to go for the encompassing nonlinear specification. Only, you know, maybe from a conceptual perspective when you want to build intuition, teaching purposes and so on, I see great advantages of sticking to, to a Mickey Mouse linearized version. So my question is, I can on, I mean, the only reason why I can imagine why, so to speak, we have not done what you did much earlier must come from other constraints, computational constraints, I guess. So what is your assessment? What is missing in terms of tools that nowadays are available from a computational perspective that on a routine basis we can do what you did and do not have to wait for another 15 years to, to wake up and say, ah, this was a space of the a corner of the parameter space which we didn't, you know, didn't have on our radar screens because we used linear methods. Thank you. So then I will hand back to you. To Thank you very respond. much for the many questions and I sense that's uh, expressing interest which uh, Jesper who is over there and I and of course our co-author Martin Haring really appreciate. Let me answer the questions in turn and let's go for the first question on what were the sources of the inflation uptick in 2021. And um, now, we've, when we filter the data, it's a mix of um, demand and supply shocks. The model has seven different structural shocks, and it's a mix of the demand and supply shocks. And you know, I, don't, can have, I cannot put my finger on exactly the you know, ratio, but it's about 50-50, if not geared a little more toward cost push shocks. But these shocks are not extraordinary. And these are shocks are not you know, super large. Now, your second question was, okay, so why didn't, you know, the, you know, why didn't the Fed, knowing what's to come according to our nonlinear model, why isn't it a nonlinear model that you know, policy was hiking rates further? Well, the devil is in the details, and it's the Taylor rule that is embedded in the model that did not dictate liftoff yet. Okay? So we did not, you know, in an attempt to not fiddle with parameters and policy specification, um, it's the Taylor rule that actually suggests a very shallow path. Uh, and, Exactly. Now, where does this 3.5% inflation target come from? That's the average rate of inflation uh, in the estimation sample since the mid-60s all the way to 2007. Okay. Now, following Anuka's uh, suggestions, it would be very interesting to look into what happens if we work with a lower inflation target and rejigger re some of the parameters pertaining to policy. I think the deeper issue is um, what did policy actually do and what should policy have done? And what we are working on right now is on a project thinking about what are the optimal monetary policy prescriptions in such an environment. You want to think about ahead, you know, if inflation gets out of hand, is it time to react more vigorously, even though you may see transitory you know, cost push shocks. So the notion of seeing through transitory shocks 
our hunch is that that becomes less of a weight if the central bank takes into account that if you're on an upswing of inflation, you're gonna, you know, may want to act a little more carefully in, in containing inflation at, toward the target without letting it go kind of all that quickly. Um, now, um, I really like your questions on uh, where does the convexity come from um, and why did we choose Kimball? Now, we chose Kimball because we wanted to work with this Metz and Valdez model. It, and Kimball is part of that very model. And it's a, it's a toolkit in many central banks and policy-making institutions. And our desire was to, you know, what happens if we wake up that sort of say feature of the model and, and give it sort of say um, the, the most important, uh, give it, you know, all the spotlight it, it you know, it, it may deserve in case it, it, it gives us interesting implications. Okay? Now, you could put the convexities elsewhere. You could think about firm-specific capital or input markets versus Kimball aggregation or put this more in the supply or on the demand side. Again, Again, our basic desire was, okay, let's do a one change at the time and work with the Kimball aggregator uh, that Smets and Valdez gives us. Okay. There is some very interesting work by David Lopez Salido and co-authors uh, before the financial crisis that actually looks into what are the implications of um, firm-specific factor markets and the implied convexity, super interesting stuff. Um, now, again, our desire was to work with this Smets and Valdez model and that could be very interesting work you know, to consider going forward. I know that you have also done very interesting work on that, that you know, bridges that. I'm looking forward to you know, catch up over, over, over coffee. Um, a very interesting comment made by that uh, in Sintra, there was a paper apparently that uh, documented that the frequency of price adjustments has changed recently. And so, quote unquote, prices become more flexible. Um, and uh, in our model, that's not the case. In our model, the amount of price changes become larger, but the underlying normal rigidity is the same. Now, uh, does this matter or doesn't it matter? Well, it matters a great deal, especially for optimal policy making, right? If you are living in a world with high inflation where all of a sudden prices are essentially flexible, then disinflating becomes much less costly in terms of economic activity compared to a situation when prices remain you know, sticky or there's more rigidity in price setting that has grave implications for the reduction required in economic activity. Okay? So again, we are... <laughs> Focusing on that right now in some ongoing work, thinking about the implications for monetary policy, you know, exactly along those lines. You know? So two observationally equivalent frameworks, what are the implications for optimal policy, especially in the, in the space for state-dependent sacrifice ratios? Um, now, um, Leo, on, uh, your, your take is very much welcome, namely what constraints did we face or why hasn't this been done earlier? Well, um, um, I think in part it's driven by the availability of computational tools and knowledge that there is a tool out there that allows to calculate the nonlinear solution of this model extremely simple and extremely user-friendly, which is Dynair. There is a hidden gem inside Dynair that not many people know about. Um, most people working with Dynair go to the default solver, which is a perturbation-based solver, first, second order, and that's it. And you know, that's a tremendous progress for the profession as you know, in the last 20 years, for sure. But there's a hidden gem inside Dynair where you can actually you know, just you know, use a different solver flag and it solves the complete nonlinear model under the assumption of certainty, certainty equivalence. Now that solver is with us ever since 15 years ago, but not many people know about that, unfortunately. Computationally, this is not really a bottleneck. You can solve a smetz Valdez type model with that solver in fractions of a second. I've been working with uh, colleagues at the Board of Governors a number of years ago already where we solved equation, models that had a thousand equations and a thousand unknowns, a multi-country model with that solver, and was able to solve it. So long story short, we have the tools available, but it seems that some people haven't, that there, there is part of the community of the profession that actually is not aware of these computational, so to say, facilities that are available at our fingertips. And, and so I can only urge you, if you uh, want to know more about that, uh, you know, I'm more than happy in the next two days to talk with you. Uh, I have codes on my website that actually provide you with example codes. I'm giving little, you know, courses once in a while here and there, teaching these methods um, to practitioners um, not that I want to do an advertisement here, but you know, these tools are available, Leo, and uh, I can only encourage people to work with these tools going forward uh, as uh, you know, my co-authors and I you know, think these are important in, in thinking about the you know, issues that we face as macroeconomists uh, these days. So thank you so much again for all the comments, for the questions. I'm looking forward to interact in the next uh, two days with you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anuka, again. <laughs> Thanks.
So with that, I think we can move to the next paper, which is on loose monetary policy and financial instability. And it will be presented by Moritz Schularik. Thank you. I guess the slides are going to come in. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us, for being here. It's, it's a great pleasure. Congratulations to the uh, organizers for putting together such a fantastic program. And uh, apologies for kind of uh, swapping the, the order of this. Those of you who uh, live in a country with better train systems don't know this feeling when you arrive at the station at 6.30 in the morning, open your app and have a complex, complex matrix of... Uh, uh, cancellations and delays in front of you and a complex optimization problem to solve at that uh, moment in time. I actually did well and I, um, you should have seen the smile on my face when I what, sat in the car from the station and said, I'm going to make it, I'm going to be there 10 minutes before my session, only to get stuck in security downstairs. So this is, um, this is my beginning of the day. So. Um, um, I hope it's going to be it's going to be better from here on. Um, anyway, so uh, loose monetary policy and financial instability. This is joint work with Max Grimm, who is a, a graduate student um, uh, from Bonn, as he's at the MIT right now. Uh, Oscar and and Alan and old team. And um, what we do in this paper is um, to ask a question. It doesn't move. I'm afraid to say. Okay, here we go. No. Here we go. Now I can just click forward. Okay, great. So um, we 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 come back to a big to a question that's been uh, asked and 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 is is regularly uh, discussed in 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 the media and in, in 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 policy circles, namely the role of loose monetary policy in um, driving boom bust episodes in financial markets and triggering uh, episodes of financial instability. Um, it's been loose monetary policy was blamed for the pre-2008 boom bust. It's been stressed again in the 2010s as a potential source of instability. You know the papers. And um, we, have, we have some theory that uh, loose monetary policy incentivize high risk taking and increase in leverage in the financial sector. And there's also a very nice paper by Frédéric Bosset and co-authors showing how this might increase financial crisis risk. However, on the empirical side, um, things are not uh, quite as satisfactory, I think, as they as we want them to be. There's a lot of I should I should say this with a big caveat because there's one of the the most important people in this literature is actually on this uh, stage and is going to discuss my uh, paper or paper in a while, namely Jose Luis. There is a lot of micro evidence um, that links uh, loose monetary policy, low interest rates, to risk taking of banks, to uh, general sort of risk appetite, risk on episodes in financial markets. Um, but if you look at the macro level, um, there is very little uh, that links those two. And actually, I was part of that author team that when I was at the New York Fed, we wrote this memo about monetary policy and financial stability. And we were looking for evidence linking um, monetary, the stance of monetary policy to financial uh, instability sort of from a macro perspective. And we couldn't find much. And this is the moment. So this is a very central bank paper it was triggered. The idea for this paper was triggered right then uh, back uh, when we had these, um, we wrote this memo. Um, so the research question is, 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 is incredibly simple and it's almost like embarrassingly simple in the sense that we just ask, does a persistently loose stance of monetary policy increase the risk of financial instability? That's it. And um, most of the sort of value added, I think, of the paper is in is in the opera, uh, is in operalizing, operationalizing this and getting it sort of the the question uh, onto into onto the data and, and structuring and getting sort of this the the, the research question um, uh, in an empirical framework where we can address it. Uh, there is an, there is a note there that a loose stands of monetary policy. What we mean by that is uh, is an interest rate uh, set by the central bank. In this case, it's going to be it's going to be a real interest rate that is below. Um, the R star, uh, the um, sort of the, the neutral rate. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more into that in just a second. So here is the argument and, and the, sort of the key theme and finding of the paper in the in a nutshell. Um, two charts on the left hand side. Um, the, the you see the year zero on the on the right of the horizontal axis is the is the year of the crisis, and there's uh, um, the red uh, dotted line which is 
the U.S. in, uh, in, in, in 2007, and you see sort of in the years before uh, the financial crisis, this is essentially sort of the, the John Taylor et al. argument that going into the 2007 uh, a global or U.S. financial crisis, in this context, I should say, uh, interest rates in the U.S., uh, real interest rates, where um, uh, the stance of monetary policy was very loose, and real interest rates were fell below neutral. And uh, then you also have the blue, uh, blue uh, solid line uh, uh, together with uh, uh, confidence intervals. Those uh, are the, is the stance of monetary policy going into uh, financial crises for the universe of modern financial crises going back all the way to 1870 for uh, a sample of uh, close to 20 uh, industrial economies. So um, this is sort of the core finding of what we have, namely that there is a, a pattern in the data, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll speak about this in the, in the remainder of the talk, that before uh, financial crises, um, the uh, real interest rate tends to be depressed uh, relative to uh, the, the neutral rate or the stance of monetary policy tends to be persistently low. And on the right-hand side, you get a hint of what we think uh, is the mechanism that links the two, namely uh, the uh, increase in, in credit uh, growth and credit booms that are triggered by persistently loose, uh, a lo persistently loose stance of monetary policy. Okay, so that's the core argument, and I'm now going to walk through this, um, um, summarizing, again, loose monetary policy is connected to medium-term risk of financial instability. Um, loose monetary policy is connected to credit market overheating. So these were these two charts on the left-hand side, the medium-term increase in uh, the, the, the depressed rate before financial crises, and then on the right-hand side, the increase in, in uh, typically the increase in, in credit growth. Um, and then we are going to argue that we think we can and should think of these relationships as causal. Uh, we're going to have an IV strategy based on the uh, macroeconomic trilemma, so the idea that in, under certain conditions uh, of pegging your exchange rate under capital mobility, your interest rates are set exogenously somewhere else, and you have to import them. We're going to use that as an instrument and show that um, the um, a, a, a loose stance of monetary policy here, one percentage point uh, looser, uh, increases, roughly doubles crisis probabilities uh, three years ahead. Okay, so what's the data? The data is from our own macro history database, um, macro financial data, banking crisis chronologies for 18 advanced economies since 1870. Um, we're also going to use the bank equity crash and alternative crisis chronologies, so the work that Matt Barron and, 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 and Emil Werner and, and Wei Xiong have done, Reinhard and Rogoff, etc. The missing element, this is all existing and this is all there, um, out there, the missing element uh, for what we have in mind and what we want to do are estimates of our stuff. And we, I guess we're going to talk about estimates of our stuff. Of course, there's some certainty, uncertainty uh, around them. It can't be observed. So. Um, we're going to define the stance of monetary policy, which is going to be our key, um, our key impulse uh, variable, if you will, um, is as the, um, the uh, difference between the real rate um, and the natural rate of interest R star, which is the equilibrium real rate of return in the case of fully flexible prices, to use Woodford's ac um, uh, canonical definition. Um, we're going to operate in a very standard framework where we say that monetary policy affects the real economy through nominal rigidities. And uh, in the case where the real rate is uh, below R star, we're going to call monetary policy expansionary. If the real rate is above R star, we're going to call it uh, restrictive. The definition of the stance that we're going to use is this one. So this is quite important. So we're going to have sort of a medium term, a five-year moving average of the uh, difference between um, the um, real uh, policy rate and the, uh, and the uh, natural rate of interest. How are we going to do R star? How do we calculate R star? We stand on the shoulders of uh, uh, a few former uh, New York Fed colleagues. Namely, uh, we're going to use the Del Negro et al. Um, method that they've done a long, they've calculated long run R star for uh, seven countries, and we're going to extend this to 18 countries. So essentially, it's a, it's, we're going to identify country specific and global long run trends uh, in R. They all connect in a VR model with common trends and, and, and long run restrictions on, on short term, long term interest rates, global interest rates, and real rates. Um, and we're going to extend what they do. 
um, from seven to 18 countries. So I'm going to be reasonably short, not only because it's quite technical, but also because there's really not much value added from, from our side here. Um, so this is what, what we get as, a, as world trends in real interest. This is the world uh, trend in the real interest rate. Uh, the red line is the, uh, the seven country long run R star estimate uh, by, um, uh, by Del Negro and, and Tamba et al. Um, the blue one is ours. It's a little higher, especially in the first, in the sort of historical periods, in the, in the first half of the 20th century, which is not surprising because relative to, to their data set, we add a lot of, you know, we add a lot of Spains and Portugals and countries where arguably maybe the, uh, the real rates in, this, in, the, in the earlier stages uh, of, of catching up were higher. Uh, you see that for the past 30 or 40 years, these two align. Uh, very nicely. Now, I'm not sure if I can click on these things. Probably not, no. So I would wanted to show you otherwise the, the country-specific R stars as well as the uh, time series of stands that result. But the time series of stands really is just we do this for all the 18 countries. We have a long-run R star for all the 18 countries. And then the difference between uh, that and the and the, uh, the, the, real, uh, the, real, uh, the real policy rate is going to be our stance measure. Okay. Um, so the econometric model to start with is, is going to be reasonably um, um, straightforward. So we're going to uh, run uh, essentially uh, local projections on an outcome variable B, which is a positive event uh, at, a, t at a point in time. And the positive event here is going to be a financial crisis or financial instability event, either narratively coded in the, in the JST way or quantitatively coded in the Baron Vernus Young way as an equity crash of, of the banking sector, uh, of the banking sector's capital base. Um, uh, these, I'm going to just tell you, but these differences in the crisis definitions don't really make a difference. They, they hardly ever do make a difference, and the, the um, overlap is, 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 is very large. Um, we're going to then uh, look at, as our key variable is going to be this stance variable, and we're obviously interested in this coefficient beta h there for the, for the various um, uh, um, sort of um, 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 projection uh, periods. We're going to have a vector of controls which has local and global control variables, um, um, anything from the typical macro variables from growth and interest rates and inflation. And, and um, uh, we also have a bunch of um, uh, country fixed effects. We, um, the global controls and time fixed effects give us very similar results. So I'm going to show you more parsimonious. We're going to use these global controls. Um, and then we're going to show you estimates of the, of the better age over a 12 year period. So it's like it's a long period or 10 or 12 year horizon where we see if central banks keep policy rates. Um, or the real policy rate, I should say, low for an extended period below the, the uh, natural rate. Um, we want to see how this over the medium term affects uh, the risk of financial instability going forward. And this is the key result. Um, this is the key, um, um, and so I'm going to take one uh, minute or two to uh, run you through this. So um, there, is a, there is a dashed line that you, I hope you can see in the back, which is the unconditional crisis probability over a three year period. It's roughly 10, 10, 12, between 10 and, 12, 10 and 11 percent. And then you have uh, the, we plot the this beta H coefficient for the various, um, for the various periods. And um, you get a, a shape of a, a time where a loose stands in me, sort of in the, in the first, over the first two to three years, lowers the crisis risk relative to the unconditional crisis probability. But then over, after four to, and then going up out to eight, year, eight years out, the financial crisis uh, risk uh, increases uh, quite substantially if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, magnitude of the effect. So we go from roughly 10 to around maybe 14, 50%. So it's not 100%, obviously. It's, a, it's an increase in, 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 in the probability that's quite marked. And uh, it's, 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 it's um, even taking the, the uncertainties of the estimation of R star into account, uh, these effects uh, seem um, uh, statistically quite, um, quite uh, clear and significant. Um, there is, uh, you see down there, there's a button of very loose MP. So these effects get much stronger if we look at periods where uh, the, like the, the, the top 20% of loose stance episodes, for example, we really have like where central banks um, kept um, this stance extremely, like, given the historical sample, obviously, extremely loose for an extended period. These crisis probabilities rise even further. So there's a 
a lot of robustness and extensions. Um, let me just run you through um, the, the most important ones. Um, we, um, I, I meant already mentioned the different, I already mentioned the different crisis chronologies. That doesn't make a big difference. Um, it doesn't make a difference if we end the sample before the global financial crisis. Uh, we can also, instead of just doing this with crisis, non-crisis, we can do this with crisis, uh, with financial recessions versus normal recessions, i.e. recessions linked to financial events. Um, if you vary into the sort of uh, um, um, R star uh, estimation, we can we can do this with the with the Holston et al uh, approach. So using the sort of the sort of the New York Fed's version of R star, um, um, we have. I mean, I mean, I showed you linear probability model. We can do this with a logistic model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, none of this changes this basic result, and let me come back to this. It is it essentially a loose stance of monetary policy ensures you against financial instability risk over like a short over the short horizon everything up to maybe four years maybe up to three years after year four uh, we we always see sort of this hump shaped curve that um, out five years out six seven years out the financial crisis risk increases significantly um, so why does this happen why does excessively why does loose monetary policy trigger financial instability and I mentioned at the beginning in this slide on the right hand side that we hypothesize that the um, that the channel through which this happens is 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 is, is the financial sector is an, is, um, is, uh, is is credit booms is asset market overheating uh, or the combination of both and obviously if, I, if we think this is the main channel then I owe you uh, some some test of that um, so we're going to go through those we're going to look at um, the role of um, the role of lo of this loose stance in in triggering credit booms and triggering house price booms, and especially their interaction. If you know the recent uh, Greenwood Schleifer et al. paper on these red zones, so we're going to look at these red zones where you know both the credit credit growth and asset prices are in a specific part of the uh, distribution. Um, so we're going to go one step back and ask: Does a loose stance of monetary policy trigger those dynamics? So let's um, we will go through in the, in the paper. We go through all of those, but let's do the the red zone exercise because I think it's maybe the more um, the most credible one in the sense that this is a definition that that um, that um, Greenwood et al. came up with. So just to remind you, it's um, being in the that we. The, the, they code um, as countries, economies entering an, a red zone in year T if uh, debt growth is um, over three year period is, is, is above the 80th percentile, asset price growth is, about, is, is in the top third, and um, the red zone then is a scenario, is a, is a situation, is a year where both the credit uh, extension and the um, asset prices, asset price growth is in these sort of extremes of the distribution, or like in these top, top areas of the distribution, the right-hand side of the distribution. Um, and they differentiate as well between household red zones, which is a combination of household credit growth and, 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 and real estate prices, and business sector R zones, where business credit and real stock prices are in these uh, parts of the distribution. So on the next slide, we're going to uh, exactly go to repeat that Greenwood uh, Schleifer et al. Uh, uh, paper and look at um, the predictive, the predictive um, content of our stance variable for these uh, for entering red zones and it looks like this on the left hand side the household sector on the right hand side the business sector it's clearer for the household sector arguably you again have a dashed line there which is the unconditional r zone probability and then you see how a loose stance uh, defined as before increases um, the uh, probability of entering these uh, household sector red zones i.e um, um, joint uh, joint credit and asset price boom situations, and it's still there for the business sector. Uh, it's a little, the business sector lending data and the stock price data a little more noisier, so it doesn't come out quite as clearly, but uh, we think it's still, uh, it's still quite there. Again, if you do this with very loose monetary policy, so, you know, the, the um, uh, um, loose stands, 20th, top 20th percentile, above the 80th percentile, and the loose distribution, then um, the, um, these effects get stronger. Um, again, um, this is uh, 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 fine to uh, um, do this not just for the Greenwood and uh, et al. post-World War II sample. You can do this for all the years. You can 
uh, zoom in um, on, you can add money growth and inflation, you can run logistic models, you can um, do decade fixed effects instead of the global controls. This is all um, um, sort of this hump, this, this shape that, you know, the, there is a, the, the, the loose stance, not immediately, but over time triggers these joint asset price and credit dynamics is quite, is quite strong in the data. Um, so none of this so far uh, can make a good claim to causality, obviously. And um, so we're going to now uh, propose an instrument for stands, uh, which is going to be an instrument that uh, Alan Oscar and I have used in previous work and, and, and others have done too, which builds on the uh, so-called trilemma of international finance, i.e. the fixed exchange rate under conditions of capital mobility. You have to import monetary policy from abroad. So we can, for uh, countries that run fixed exchange rate regimes under uh, capital mobility, um, uh, build an instrument that just says that the variation in the local interest rate, and in this case the variation in the local stands, is affected by what happens abroad. And you know the assumption is then, I mean, this is uh, is that the 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 the, um, the base country. Uh, the policy setting in the base country uh, doesn't uh, pay all that much attention to the conditions in the home, in the pegging country when setting rates. So there's, there's more to this. We, um, we, um, we actually then also, we also run a sort of tailor rule for the, for the base country and just use the residual from that and sort of taking the, the expected uh, changes in the base countries out if you, uh, details are in the paper, but the basic the basic idea is, is simply that that you know if you think about um, the um, the Scandinavian crisis in the early 90s, the Bundesbank after unification raises interest rates, the the Swedes is, are packed and and the, the Scandinavian currencies are packed, so they have to raise their interest rates too into an asset price boom at the time, and then you tr trigger the Scandinavian financial crisis. I think that's these interest rate um, response is something that we'll hear a little bit in the discussion, which I think is a very important point. Okay, so we, um, we uh, build this instrument, so we, and then instrument the stance with um, the, um, what comes from abroad and with the exogenous changes in monetary conditions imported to the um, pegging country. Here's a, you know, this is with, with the ECB, so this is a Eurozone perspective. You get the, uh, the, the stance in the pre-2008 Eurozone, you had this idea that the core and the periphery uh, had very different um, had very different stances for monetary policy. Uh, the ECB, uh, I guess, um, rightly, um, you know, focused mostly on on what was happening in the big uh, economies in the so-called core, and that resulted in a in an import of monetary conditions, arguably, in uh, Greece or Portugal or somewhere else that was. Um, uh, to lose, and this is sort of exactly the, the setting, I mean, just to sort of give you the idea of that instrument that we exploit, in this case, systematically over 150 years, and you know for a long time, most exchange rates were packed, so we have quite a lot of uh, observations there. Um, so we instrument the stance, and um, then um, look at, again, come back to our first, the very first chart that I showed you, the crisis risk. Um, in, uh, in, in response to cri as how, how uh, monetary uh, loose stance here then instrumented uh, by the, uh, by the uh, trilemma IV um, affects crisis risk. Uh, you see here these effects get uh, considerably larger. Um, so relative to an unconditional crisis probability of around 10%, we now have um, at, a, at a sort of 100 uh, basis point looser stance um, almost, I mean, I don't want to say triples this, but like de definitely doubles this. Again, you get this very persistent, I mean, this is the, the most persistent shape we get of all of these um, long run regressions is in the short run, a loose stance isolates you or reduces crisis risk um, somewhere from year four or five on, uh, we see these probabilities increasing. And as you see here, if you buy into, you know, broadly speaking, that there is some exogenous variation in monetary conditions that we pick up with this instrument, uh, then uh, you, you will think that uh, sort of causally then um, there is a, an increase in crisis risk down the road, peaking somewhere around year seven, eight, um, after the, uh, the loose episode. Um, um, after the sort of the after the policy turns turns loose, um, so um, if we instrument, we do the same now again to to think about the channel through which loose stance affects 
um, crisis risk. Again, we um, think about mainly think about the uh, um, role of, of credit conditions and, and asset price trends. And here you see on the left hand side again the red zone, uh, Greenwood et al. definition. Um, you can do, but you can very much um, do, uh, paint or um, uh, see similar uh, trends in in the um, in, in just in credit growth or in asset prices deviations where. Um, you know, in a similar way, credit growth picks up, uh, then peaks around year eight. That's uh, you know nicely, uh, nicely in, in sync, if you will, uh, or not so nice, but in sync with the crisis risk probabilities, and then uh, then the probability, the red zone probability, uh, drops um, quite strongly. Um, I guess because um, there is a reversal and, and often in a reversal in a crisis. Again, for the business sector, things are a little bit, a little bit less clear. That also has to do, as I mentioned, with the uh, high, this is the, the com remind you, this is a combination of having a, um, um, credit growth to companies being in the top 20% and uh, stock price growth being in the top third of the, distribu of the country specific distribution. Um, the stock prices are very noisy, so things are a little bit less. But I think that's um, something that um, uh, is also in the original paper. It still paints the same picture. Okay, <coughs> so let me use my last few minutes to um, talk about something that I guess we're, as economists, ultimately interested in. I mean, we care about financial stability. I mean, a little bit per se, but also because, or mainly because it affects the real economy. So um, loose monetary a loose stance might not be you know there's a, there's a, there's a trade off in the air no there might not be bad per se at least we cannot say much about this trade off for now because we say like in the short run um, running this loose stance is expansionary that's why central banks uh, choose a loose stance and that's the way of transmission and that's what we um, oh that's the way of, of stable stabilization that's what we that's why we do this. Um, but it might come at a cost, and it might come uh, might have sort of the the, the very loose um, have, running a loose policy uh, might come at the cost of financial instability in the medium run. But also, and this is what we're going to test now, uh, it might come at growth costs uh, down the road. So, um, what we're going to test here is in line with you know some of the work that, that Atif Mian or Tobias Adrian and others have done, sort of in this whole growth at risk um, um, context is to look for negative medium real economic effects. So do we see that a, um, a loose stance of monetary policy uh, is also predictive um, of, for uh, bad growth outcomes in the medium, uh, in the medium run? You will, this will remind you a little bit of the, the Mian Sufi uh, Werner paper, QJE paper where they sort of use credit growth and then look at growth forward. Um, this is not an axis that we're not using credit growth, but we're using the stance measure and ask sort of with the transmission through the credit markets if we see the this medium term medium term negative effect the the, uh, the downturn um, being triggered by or being 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 a co uh, consequence of of a loose stance. So what we're going to do is we're going to define low output growth as um, obviously for for e for each country as uh, output. At being or growth changes being in the lowest uh, fifth of the distribution. Uh, but we're also going to use Baron or Sewer's um, um, series of economic disasters, which they define as peak to trough falls in real GDP of at least 10%. So we're going to replace the left hand side variable. It's not going to be crisis risk, it's not going to be, or crisis probability, it's not going to be red zone probability. We're just going to say uh, we're going to use instead low output growth or uh, an economic disaster a variable from Baron or Sewer. And this is how it looks. Um, this is a growth risk trade-off emerging quite um, clearly from our, from our work. So uh, again, there's an unconditional low output growth probability, which is 20%. And uh, then the, um, um, by construction, and then the, uh, the loose stance um, increases the probability of, coming, of, of an economy uh, getting into a low output growth um, um, environment. Uh, by about what is it, 20 20 percent relative to the baseline. Um, maybe even more worrisome um, if you think about um, avoiding the big disasters and, and, and the welfare costs associated with them um, is the uh, result on the right hand side for the Baron Ursua 
uh, economic disasters, so peak to trough slums in, in real GDP of 10% or more. Um, here, a, a loose monetary, a loose policy stance, again, buys you some insurance in the, in the empirical data, and maybe I haven't stressed this enough, but this is pretty much the universe of modern macro data that we have, with the universe of modern crisis that we have. So, you know, to overturn these shapes in these, in these charts, we'll have to wait quite a long time. Uh, or at a lot of countries that, uh, for which we don't have data at yet. Um, but you, this, this sort of hump-shaped curve uh, emerges very nicely again, that the probability of disaster doesn't quite double, but goes up by a significant amount after loose stands. Again, it's not, it's, there's, a, there's a short run, sort of benign, um, if you will, uh, benign or, 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 or sort of insurance effect maybe, and then um, the disaster probability uh, rises significantly. Um, so um, let me let me uh, conclude and, and maybe also uh, finish a minute early, um, which is um, which is um, a uh, this paper tried to uh, answer that question for which in my reading of the literature when we wrote this memo for the for the for the board, uh, the literature didn't have, have an, an answer. Namely, what's the macro evidence that all this sort of risk-taking micro-literature that has been well-documented, you know, umpteenth papers about the bank risk-taking channel and how banks respond to low interest rates. But if you, I think if you're, if we're, we're sort of, we looked at the evidence and at the literature back then and said like, well, yeah, there's a lot of this micro stuff, but we really don't know if any of this micro stuff adds, to, adds up to much in macro. I mean, I guess that's an endemic problem with some of the finance literature that people identify very well, identify very well often effects, but we don't really know how to think about them in a macro context. And our conclusion at the time was that after reading a lot of micro papers that yes, there are effects, but we don't really know how to, um, what to tell monetary policy makers, how important these effects are on the, for the macro economy. Um, and so we sat down, gathered this data set and, 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 uh, and, and constructed these long run ASTA estimates using, using macros and, and, and tumbers, et cetera, uh, methodology. And, now I think we, we, we're in a position to say that um, there is evidence, you know, and you open to you and, and you decide how convincing you think that is, in these broad cross-country long-run data that episodes of when monetary policy, real policy rates were below the, uh, the neutral, uh, the equilibrium rate for um, this sort of, you know, remember we do this five-year moving average for an extended period, uh, this has measurable impact on crisis probabilities going forward. Um, the effects are um, first in the first short run, things uh, look quite good and maybe even buy some insurance against the crisis. But from year five, peaking around year seven, eight, crisis probabilities uh, should, um, I, mean, I shouldn't say shoot up, but they increase significantly. Um, we also showed you, and I think that's, uh, that's the point that was important also to, to us, as given our previous research agenda, that the evidence linking loose monetary policy stance to uh, crisis risk running through credit and asset markets is there. It's broadly compatible with what we, uh, what we find. So this is, you know, we can at least open the black box a little bit and, uh, and, and make sense of these developments. And I think that might have nice impl well, interesting implications for macro proof frameworks, et cetera, that uh, really we, we, you know, you can point to the, uh, from a macro perspective now also to the factors that intermediate uh, from, uh, from loose uh, policy or expansionary policy to uh, crisis risk. And uh, good, and then there, last but not least, there are um, real effects. And these real effects are uh, potentially um, uh, uh, severe, and so they have to be valued against the short-run gains of, uh, of loose or of, of expansionary monetary policy. I leave it here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the presentation, for being on time, both <laughs> with starting and ending. <laughs> and now the discussion will be done by Jose Luis Pedro. Yeah, if I can have the slides. Uh, and can I move the slides? All 
Okay, so let me start with um, thanking the, uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me to discuss these very nice papers. I've been discussing Shularik, Jorda, and Taylor, uh, many other papers, and I will be uh, again discussing next month another paper. So, so it's always a, it's a also always always a great uh, pleasure, and also it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Let me just put one summary, uh, one page summary of the paper. There is this motivation that commentators have argued that low monetary policy rates might create excessive risk taking. If you go back to the Jackson Hole paper uh, of Raghu Rajan in 2005, and many, many other people, Jeremy Stein, when he was governor of the, of the Fed. And there has been theory built up on that, and there is a huge uh, empirical evidence. And this huge empirical evidence is more micro in the sense of loan level data, security level data, etc. So what is missing is what is in the black in, in ball, which is this evidence, lack of evidence of aggregated banking crisis. And this is what the paper of uh, Shularik and co-authors uh, bring, uh, bring a new analysis. Now, what do they do? They use this. So the question is whether the stance of monetary policy over a persistent uh, period of time, this increases the likelihood of uh, banking crisis. Uh, they use this, I might say, super interesting uh, and amazing data of macro history, uh, 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 you know, by, by Shularik, uh, Jourda, and Taylor. They have also the uh, banking chronology of crisis, and they add in this paper this R start uh, building in another paper by Del Negro, etc. And this is the new data that they bring in. And basically, the results in the last part of the slides is basically that after a period, after a long period of soft monetary policy, uh, this increases in a quantitatively sense the probability of a banking crisis. And the intermediate channels are credit, uh, credit boons and asset prices. And this will be the, uh, the, the summary. So I have one general comment and two specific comments, and I will develop the two specific comments. On the general comments, and not because I'm here and, and, I, and I truly believe and I use this data, these are truly excellent papers. This in particular is a truly excellent paper both on, on the methods, on the question, and on the interesting results. And I, I would stop here. Uh, I truly would stop here because that's, that's the... But of course, the organizers invited me to say something more. And so I'm going to tell two specific comments. The first one I'm going to say is that it's not just purely low interest rates. There is also higher monetary policy rates that might matter, and I will argue with several slides why is this the case. I will put motivating slides on why this is the case, and then I will go a paper by uh, two uh, former colleague, colleagues of mine, Dimitri Kunishok and Bjorn Richter from Pompeo Fabra, and a long-term co-author, Gabriel Jimenez from Bank of Spain. Now, our paper is complements, I think, complements perfectly the paper by Shularik, by Kreen et al. And moreover, and more importantly, in order to say is we built on the paper of Jourda, Shularik, Taylor, on the amazing data and service to the whole profession that you can go Google and get the data. Okay, so let me put uh, this there. So this will be my first comment. I will have a couple of slides on this. The second one is going to be on the R start. And the R start, you know, if you read the book by Butford, that might be very important for many, many, and, and of course, he, I am here in a central bank, might be very important for the stance of monetary policy. But I want to argue, apart from some issues on the estimation on the R start, I want to bring something more related to whether, for banks in particular, for banking crisis, I want to argue whether only this deviation from R start matters, or for banks, as we saw in Silicon Valley Bank, but I will also put you other examples, whether also nominal rates uh, matter. Okay, so these are going to be my two, my two comments. Let me start by the first one. So in the first one, uh, these are important case uh, studies of important financial crisis, banking crisis, 
I put, since I am also now in London, I put the Bering's crisis when they put out of uh, money Bering's in Argentina, Scandinavian crisis, the US. Let me go from this uh, US, uh, the 1929, the Japanese crisis and the Spanish crisis since I am from Barcelona. So the first one is like, as you can see, the crisis started, you know, the banking crisis started in 1930 but the stock market prices started in 1929, which is here. As you can see, there were a lot of, it's, it's like a U of monetary policy rate. They lowered the interest rates, they created a credit boom, and an asset price boom, in particular stock prices, and then they raised monetary policy rates, and the crisis comes. This is not gonna happen with recessions. This is not gonna happen with non-financial rece non recessions, even with non-financial recessions, deep recessions. This is something only to do with banking crisis. Uh, it's the same story with the Japanese crisis, okay? So the Japanese with the Platz Agreement, they lower, they started increasing the interest rates in 1995 and until the start of the crisis in 1990, and my country, Spain, have a similar issue. Okay, so these are some case studies. I will argue that these are not case studies. I didn't cherry pick these case studies. I'm gonna show you that all these big, big financial crises are like this. But before telling you something like this, I wanna use a person who is very important uh, in the profession, which is, uh, and I, I took it from a paper by uh, David Lopez Salido, uh, which is Bernanke. And Bernanke said, if you read it here, look at this part, the market crash of October uh, 1929 show that the concerned effort by the Fed can bring down stock prices. But the cost of this victory was very high. You know, you have a crash on the stock market prices and a, uh, and a banking crisis. So these two, the, the so far these two motivations are telling you that higher monetary policy rates are important, not only low monetary policy rates, and I might be a combination of the two. And the last motivation evidence is from last two years. So here I have many ones. Uh, so in, in 2022, both the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England and other central banks started raising interest rates. And we have seen problems in the Italian sovereign market. The ECB even created the transmission protection instrument at that time. Yesterday in the Financial Times, there were some issues in some countries, uh, including the United States, especially, but also Italy. So sovereign debt markets, uh, you know, I was living at that time uh, and I was in the Bank of England with the pension LDI funds and the guilds. There were the crypto distress. There has been other ones, for instance, the vice president here of the uh, European Central Bank said recently that the commercial and real estate potentially has a problem. And since we are more since this paper is more about banks, let me just highlight on bank failures. Here, when I highlight bank failures of the Silicon Valley Bank, etc., I mean, it's clear the U-shape of monetary policy rates. Because these banks, they took a lot of risk when the interest rates were low. And when they created all these problems is when the interest rates went up. Okay, so, you know, it seems in the last year that also not only in history, but in the last year, higher monetary policy rates in combination with previous low rates might have pre created a problem. I have a paper which is related to, to, to Moritz, uh, which is this paper, is, uh, we use the same data, JST means uh, Jurda, Shularik, and Taylor. I have this paper with uh, Jimenez, Kunishok, and Richter. What do we find in this paper? It's, it's highlighted in bold. So monetary policy rates, so low monetary policy rates create a banking crisis, but only if, only if, you then raise uh, strongly, uh, you raise, you hide strongly the monetary policy rates. This is for the last 150 years, this is not last year, this is 150 years, using the, the data by Shularik and, and co-authors. So it's a combination of two, and I will argue why is the case uh, with, with the channels. One, and this is not non-financial recessions, not at all non-financial recessions, not at all uh, even deep non-financial recessions. Let me just put you here. The post-World War deep crisis, the, the worst ones. All of them, all of them 
came from a you. You lower the monetary policy rates for a long period of time. There was a credit boom, an asset price boom. And then when you rise significantly the monetary policy rates, the crisis came, not from the other ones. And all of these monetary policy cycles have the same number of observations. It's not that just you have one particular monetary policy cycle, and that's why you get the crisis. And this does not happen with non-financial recessions, and not even with a strong non-financial recessions. What are the channels? The channels, uh, uh, Moritz was talking about the, this red zone. And in the red zone, there's a paper by um, Greenwood and co-author Andreas Leifer in the Journal of Finance, that basically they said, if you're in a red zone, that's the best predictor. If you have high credit, uh, uh, you know, high credit and high asset prices, then with high probability, uh, high probability, you will have a, a, a crisis. And in fact, they say, lean against the win and raise the monetary policy rates. What we find in our paper is that's not the case. If you lean against the wind once you, are in the, once you are in this boom of the red, the red per se, the red zone per se, does not translate into a financial crisis. It is a combination of the red zone with this U of monetary policy. Because the U of monetary policy brings you uh, the excessive risk taking in credit and asset pricing. And when you raise the monetary policy rates, you cut on asset prices, you cut on credit, and the crisis comes. So in fact, the leaning against the, the win by raising monetary policy rates in the red zone is too late. That will be, uh, that will be this paper. Another thing I want to say, I have three minutes, is we would like to know a bit more uh, on the channels. And uh, with these co-authors of mine, we have, apart from this amazing data that we built on, on Jordan, Shularik, and Taylor, we have the credit register of Spain that have a couple of crises. And what we see there with loan level data is that the defaults, the loan defaults come not just from low rates or high rates, come from a combination of the two. When you have low rates, worse banks and risky borrowers, they take a lot of risk. That doesn't create defaults. And then when you raise the monetary policy rates, defaults are coming. Of course, we don't have defaults yet, which is a big mystery, but there has been all this moratoria, no? in the last years with the COVID and all these things. But it seems that in 2023, uh, defaults are going up. And there are some uh, perspectives no? that in 2024 could be a bit worse. That would be the thing. And let me, so I have two minutes. On the Silicon Valley Bank, let me just, let me just say something on the Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank, many people thought, OK, let's only analyze uh, public debt. And in public debt, automatically, if uh, interest rates go up, asset prices go down, and you have market losses from public debt. And these are very visible because you have a mark to market. But with loans, it's the same. The thing is that you don't have a mark to market. But if the loans are with variable interest rates, and these people have to, have, have to pay higher interest rates, they are going to default. And in some countries, they, they are going to have fixed rates. But the maturity might be short, might not be long. And so they have to renew it. And they would renew it at high interest rates. And they will not be able to pay. And if, if it was purely fixed rate, which you don't renew it, like in the case of Mark Zuckerberg, I think, no, with the, with the, with the mortgage that he got uh, in First Republic, I think, then you have an interest rate risk there. So basically, something that we have not seen yet uh, fully is the non-performing loans. Uh, and that will be a channel. And the last slide, the last slide that I have, uh, and I have uh, 40 minutes, uh, 40 sec uh, seconds, is, you know, like there are many, we are in a central bank. Yesterday I was talking with a colleague of mine, Jordi Galli. There are people who are very macroeconomists, and for them, only matters the, dif the, the, dif um, the, the difference between the real rate minus the implied, uh, minus the R star. Now, that would be perfect for macro models, the boot for 20, uh, 2003. But in banking, if you think about Silicon Valley Bank, think about Silicon Valley Bank or the paper that I was putting, it also matters nominal rates. And why matters nominal rates? It's the same thing that we saw in Silicon Valley Bank. If you buy the interest rate, if you buy the security at very low rate and you have to raise the interest rate, 
even if it is not, you are not changing the nominal or you are not changing the deviation uh, with the R start, you are going to have market losses. And it's the same thing uh, with loan defaults. So, and why is that? Because banking, banking, both the loans, deposits, and the securities that banks buy are at nominal rates. They are not at real rates. I'm not saying that the deviation, I'm not saying, uh, Maurice, that the deviations from R star are not important. I'm just saying that for banks, and this paper, remember, is about bank crisis and banks, it might also be important uh, nominal, uh, nominal rates. And just the last thing, uh, Viral will present a paper. It's a different paper, but Viral's uh, papers with Raghu Rajan and Stefan is, is a paper that is not just QE, it's just QE and QT. And this is, in a sense, related. It's not just low, per se, in this case, expansive of the QE. It's just a combination, for instance, in that case, QE, QT. Here is a combination of low rates, high rates. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And it has been a pleasure to discuss your paper. Yeah, again, before opening for the Q&A, I would like to give uh, Moritz the opportunity to respond. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you. You were very generous. Uh, thanks for these great comments. Uh, I should mention that two of the co-authors are former students of mine, Dmitry Kuchinov and yes. Biorita, so you came back with them. I mean, no, but it's, it's, um, I, think these, I think these points are complementary. I mean, they, 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 they complement it complements in the sense that they, uh, they add to our knowledge. So I, um, I think what, what we can show, or what we try to show is that the um, these sort of deviation, the loose stance, the deviation from Asta triggers these credit dynamics. And I think there is, you know, I think low rates, no, low nominal rates and a loose stance will be correlated to some extent. I think that's, I think that's fine. Um, where our paper is indeed silent is about what triggers the, what triggers the crisis. No, and I think I'm very sympathetic to, on, on the historical evidence that this is often the case when central banks turn the rate cycle uh, when uh, sometimes, I mean, sort of surprising, leaning against, surprises and leaning against the wind. Uh, we have a paper on this, tend to be a very bad idea and, and trigger crisis dynamics. So I think that's, that's really, really very much along these lines and, and, and absolutely, uh, absolutely true. Um, I think we don't understand quite, I mean, maybe it would be a question I have back for you. Is that increase in rates, is that is that a policy decision or is that sort of in a Wixellian sense, is that a competition for, mark for funding and sort of rates, um, rates in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, um, in the in the banking sector just uh, uh, go up because you run out of funds to fuel the credit boom, et cetera. So I think there's lots of open questions. I think I'm very sympathetic overall to these, um, to these comments, especially what is the trigger that then gets us from the credit asset price boom into the crisis mode um, and rates Nominal rates and central bank actions likely play a big role. Any questions from the room? Uh, yeah, David. So you will get a microphone. Thank you. So this is a great paper. Uh, big fan of the literature. Uh, now that you're here, I want to just try to, uh, to see if you can help me with something that uh, I don't quite follow from this uh, uh, kind of research line. So I, I understood what, uh, that the people try to use this uh, you know, dynamic correlation to think about mechanism. So what is the transmission mechanism? What, what do I think about you know, special features of the economy and try to tease out? different way of thinking about the nature of crisis and why crises appear and what is one of the key mechanisms. Think about theory and try to tease out element of theory. But, but you, you keep emphasizing that most of, the, most of the job with your effort is to try to identify a causal effect. So try to find, try to connect policy actions to you know, outcomes. In particular, you try to uh, link policy actions to uh, crisis outcomes. That's a, that's a fantastic uh, research question. So, uh, but, but most of the analysis that you do was pretty much what I call in-sample prediction, right? So, so you have a sample and you try to predict, you know, 
within the sample certain crises, certain type of events, and correlate those events with a measure of what you call policy. Have you tried to think about the extent to which you can do some uh, okay. out of sample uh, analysis? So, I mean, uh, Jose Luis was alluding to something like that. It would be interesting to me to see uh, whether you can run some sort of, uh, you know, uh, out of sample posterior analysis to try to pick a few exercises, a few, few countries uh, in which, you know, with your model, uh, try to understand whether the prediction that you are claiming are, are causal are, are very helpful in actually mm -hmm. pinning down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these, uh, these crisis probabilities. And it could be, mm -hmm. you know, you know situation that satisfies some of the criteria that you have to identify mm -hmm. what is the exogenous component of this, you know, way of measuring the policy stance. So mm -hmm. it will be interesting to see whether you can show these uh, with this beautiful data set mm -hmm. that you'll be building over time. So this is great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'd like to collect so Carlo was here. Okay, thanks, Carlo Altavilla, ECB. No, uh, just uh, in the spirit of the conference that would bridge practice and mm -hmm. science, do you have probably in mind uh, an average cycle that would characterize uh, your results? So monetary policy lose, for, but how lose? How much is, how, how is lose? Mm -hmm. So the size, the depth of this loosening, mm -hmm. the persistence, how much is persistent? So if you can mm. maybe describe uh, probably uh, what is in the, mm. probably what comes out of the result. Mm. And second would be whether there are uh, heterogeneity in the cross-section of country that uh, mm. would, uh, more, um, would more influence the probability mm. of the crisis. Mm -hmm. So probably there is a, pol there are po for sure there are policy mistakes in the crisis, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the sample, or there is a huge deviation in GDP mm. or in the other star. Maybe all these also play a large role Thanks. Yes, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Burr in the back. Very nice uh, work. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I want to ask, you know, I've never heard this concept of red zone, uh, which was sort of <laughs> cool, I thought, but I wanted to ask you more, is have they sort of, uh, following up what David said, have they sort of checked this sort of out of sample? Have they done some, ep you know, when they, it seems like you're really picking on certain percentiles that make you suspicious mm -hmm. that it's not mm -hmm. sort of robust. But if you could tell us a little bit how you sort of mm -hmm. check that this is a reliable measure. Mm -hmm. And then I was curious, one of the first figures you showed with the sort of the persistent decline in policy rate, R minus R star, mm -hmm. say persistent 2%, would give you say 10% on the credit to GDP. It doesn't strike me a lot, no, if I think about sort of, you know, in Sweden, you know, the run-up when the Riksbank, uh, you know, had this discussion where they were leaning against Sweden, you had credit GDP running at roughly 180% of GDP, you know, are you going to trade that off, you know, 10% down, say, say, 180 instead of 190 for a persistent 2% uh, hike in the policy rate? That's, that's like a tough, tough trade-off there. Just want to hear your thoughts about that. Thanks. So maybe mm. one or two more short ones. Not 100% sure. Um, yeah, Klausen. Yeah, very, very short. <laughs> Fascinating discussion. The author and the uh, discussion could go together and, and ask the following, try to answer the following question. If monetary policy is, too, is very expansionary for the long period, it could show, does it only show up in asset prices? Does it show up in inflation? And if it show up in inflation, is the reaction Jose Luis showed a reaction to higher inflation? And if monetary policy does, would also be interesting, does not react because there may be a financial dominance situation, they let inflation go to avoid the financial crisis. So you have two additional trade-offs mm -hmm. when you look at the full spectrum of what the expansionary policy would lead to in terms of inflation and how then monetary policy reacts knowing the trade-off between letting inflation go or creating a financial crisis. Thanks. So then the final one would be there. Thanks, Moritz. Uh, real, yeah. really great paper, really. Uh, just one question. Related to Rosa Louis' uh, point, but sticking to real rates, because mm -hmm. it seems that some of the channel you emphasize <coughs> on house prices, credit growth, etc., would apply uh, if interest rates are low, uh, just because R star is low and not because R is below R star. Mm -hmm. So can you say more about why mm -hmm. use R minus R star and not uh, just R? Mm -hmm. And have you done it with R mm -hmm. and does it give similar results? Yeah. 
the point. Um, Thank you. So more, you. <laughs> I guess that last one, we've tried R star. It's really about the gap that we get most of the action. So the low R star itself in our framework is not to the same extent. You get similar shapes, but like the the, the, the sort of the significance and, and, these, um, and the, 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 the precision of, in the estimates really comes from the stance variable. Um, same for inflation, I'm going to be short and you can answer the difficult part of that. Um, um, we see a little bit of that, I mean, you know, in the boom, inflation goes up. So that could be the trade-off that you described that could be, could be real. And, you know, we, we might want to look at the outcomes where these credit booms that were not followed by rate hikes. Um, uh, to what extent that is, uh, these trade-offs are materialized in, in, in the data and we can study them. Um, but uh, to these comments here, that, which were excellent, I think, yeah, absolutely, I do agree. This, is not a, this was not designed as a policy exercise. This was, we started off at like, looking, uh, looking at the data, let's see what's out there in terms of, as you say, an in-sample analysis of what's there. I mean, we, we, what I showed you, we cut the sample, we split the sample, we left out the 2008 crisis and these relationships remain there, but that's not the same as saying with real-time information available to policymakers at the time, um, is this, are these predictive, uh, is this predictive content there? That would be an amazing exercise. It would be high, it would be, I think it's a separate paper, it would be an amazing exercise. Be, we, we've done a paper with Bjorn actually and another co-author uh, where we did something like do in real time, if you have asset price and credit data, Again, the non-revised, but the original data, you know, all these macro data get revised all the time. So it, it really doing this for 150 years is a tr would be a tremendously valuable, but it's, it's a very difficult, a very difficult exercise. In this paper um, uh, with Bjorn and, 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 and Paul Wachtel, actually, we found that in real time, sort of with the data available to policymakers in real time, not using any look ahead bias, just look, looking sort of one sided filtering or whatever you want to do. Um, there still is predictive information in, but this is not this paper, it's a different paper, in, in credit and in asset prices for financial crisis. But the R star we haven't done. I think that that's complicates the whole exercise. But the trade-offs and, and, and the Swedish example, I think Lars always comes up with the Swedish example as well. It is true um, that uh, some of these um, uh, sort of elasticities you will don't look so attractive. Uh, absolutely true. Um, on the other hand, 10% um, of GDP is also not nothing. And, you know, if you think about what might really be the uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg or that what really triggers the, the, the X of speculation, maybe that is the 10% where we want to avoid. But I agree, uh, like sort of the, doing the back of the envelope calculation, it's, 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 it, uh, it's not, it doesn't look very attractive. Yeah, so before, before I go to that, on the red zone is, is particular uh, for both. You do that, yeah. It's particular on a very short period of time. Uh, we took the red zone independently mm. because we don't cherry pick the red zone and it was in a particular uh, point in time and it works for the 150 years. Mm. And in fact, if you switch, if you cherry pick a small thing, you get a United States. Because the United States in the, you know, in the 1929 crisis doesn't enter because the red zone there, it was almost a red zone, but it was not a red zone. Okay, so this is out of uh, sample uh, estimation. And then on the inflation uh, coming from Spain, uh, there is another thing that it doesn't tackle in this paper, which is just credit aggregate and asset prices, uh, both uh, you know, for business and for uh, real estate. But in, 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 in Spain, in the boom, there was a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-tradable, uh, you know, boom, which was, I think, inflation was important because the tradable could not compete with the high inflation from the non-tradable. So this is something that we both, uh, we could, both of papers could incorporate and would answer uh, to your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody. So this concludes the first session. Thank you to the presenters, discussants, and also to you, uh, the audience, with the questions. We now will have lunch. So lunch will be served in the foyer. So if you go through the door and pass on to the back. And I would like to ask you to be back on time at 2 p.m. when the uh, next session will start. Thank you very much.